Our next presenter is Joshua Matson. Joshua M. Matson is a PhD candidate in the religions of Western antiquity at Florida State University, and he'll be defending his dissertation in May. He's also the director of the Tallahassee Institute of Religion and a former research associate with the Scripta Qumranica Electronica project at the University of Haifa. He holds a master's in biblical studies from Trinity Western University and a bachelor's in ancient Eastern studies with university honors from Brigham Young University. His research focuses on the Dead Sea Scrolls, specializing in materially and textually reconstructing fragmentary manuscripts, and he's fascinated in studying the New Testament as a collection of ancient Jewish texts. Brother Matson's paper is entitled, Placing Hebrews Amidst the Studies of the New Testament Among the Latter-day Saints. In the October 2018 General Conference, many members of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints were surprised to learn about an adjustment to the way in which Latter-day Saints would learn doctrine, strengthen faith, and foster greater personal worship while studying the New Testament in 2019. While the Come Follow Me curriculum introduced at the General Conference marked a sizable shift in the way Latter-day Saints would approach the study of the New Testament, the adjustment was only the latest in a history of alterations aimed at aiding Latter-day Saints in their study of the scriptures, for deepening individual conversion, and preparing for the second coming of the Lord. In the time that we are together virtually, I would like to outline this history of the study of the New Testament within the church by underscoring the historical context of important adjustments and alterations to the study of scripture, and looking at important works that were produced and distributed to support these adjustments. The purpose of this discussion is to highlight ways in which Latter-day Saints have, and continue, to both follow and resist societal trends to create a uniquely Latter-day Saint approach to the study of the New Testament. Such a recognition is particularly valuable in a conference associated with the BYU New Testament Commentary Project, as it articulates the necessity of having a uniquely Latter-day Saint commentary series that incorporates a wide range of publications by Latter-day Saints dealing with the New Testament and addresses components of the New Testament that are of particular importance to Latter-day Saint teachings and doctrine. To achieve this purpose, I will first discuss the importance of the New Testament to Latter-day Saints. Following this, I will divide the 190-year history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints into five periods, each of which share a common theme or approach to the study of the New Testament specifically and scriptures generally. For each of these five periods, I will highlight a couple of major societal trends in the study of the New Testament, show how the church either incorporated or resisted such trends, and then highlight a couple of the major publications that shaped the study of the New Testament within those periods. Because of the constraints on time, the presentation of each period will be brief, but a fuller discussion on each period will be found in an article that will appear in the introductory volume of the BYU New Testament Commentary Series. Latter-day Saints revere the New Testament. From the beginnings of the Restoration, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have studied the New Testament as their primary source for understanding Jesus Christ and the organization of his church. Referring to this engagement with the New Testament, philosopher Paul Hedingren wrote, Latter-day Saints revere the New Testament for its accounts of the birth, ministry, atonement, and resurrection of the Savior, Jesus Christ. The teachings of Jesus in the New Testament comprise the core of Latter-day Saint doctrine, and their preeminence is a set evidence by their frequent appearance in other Latter-day Saint standard works, accepted as scripture, and in Latter-day Saint speaking and writing. The writings of the New Testament apostles are accepted and appreciated for their doctrine and wise and inspired counsel and for the documenting the apostolic challenge of proclaiming the gospel, adhering to the original teachings of Christ, and establishing the unity of the faith, and promoting the righteousness of believers in a rapidly growing church. While numerous works have focused on how Latter-day Saints, more directly the leaders of the church, have utilized the Bible in sermons, periodicals, as inspiration for revelation and biblical interpretation, Scholars have largely overlooked the way in which the ordinary practitioners of the faith study the New Testament to enhance the Latter-day Saint experience. 
The primary purpose of this presentation is to provide a chronological analysis of how Latter-day Saints have been influenced in their study of the New Testament by societal trends, the church's study programs, and publications on the New Testament by Latter-day Saint leaders and scholars. In the middle of the 19th century, individuals witnessed an evolution in public perceptions concerning the approaches to the Bible in America. With the rise and spread of individual sovereignty throughout the United States between 1780 and 1820, the balance of power over the interpretation of the Bible shifted from preacher to congregant. Historian Philip Barlow recognizes this shift within religious communities, stating, by the onset of the egalitarian age of Jackson, privately interpreted scripture rivaled or surpassed the clergy and the traditional creeds as the preeminent religious authority of the land. By proclaiming themselves as sovereign in their interpretations, students of the Bible in America continued to ponder, discuss, and debate the nature of the scriptures and their application in their own lives. Within this atmosphere of individual sovereignty, Joseph Smith developed his own approach to the study of the Bible, shaping the way in which the Latter-day Saints facilitated an enhanced study of the New Testament during the early years of the movement. Joseph Smith utilized biblically informed language in his sermons, viewed the biblical text with selective liberal, literalism, held a dissatisfaction with the current state of the biblical text, and emphasized his disbelief in the Bible as the sole and final authority in doctrine. The foundational documents of the church further highlight unique approaches to studying the New Testament that stood in contrast to other Christian approaches of the day. In addition to Smith's own perceptions concerning the biblical text mentioned above, the Book of Mormon Smith's published revelations and transmitted expansion texts of the Bible influenced Latter-day Saint perceptions of the New Testament. These perceptions included the Book of Mormon's teachings that plain and precious truths and covenants were omitted from the Bible that required restoration. These are found in 1 Nephi 13. Additionally, the revelations of Joseph Smith included texts associated with John the Beloved, Doctrine and Covenant 7, and a question and answer revelation pertaining to the meaning of components of the book of Revelation, Doctrine and Covenant 77, that highlight that the New Testament was not a fixed text in antiquity or contained all of the writings of New Testament authors, but required additional texts and inspired interpretations. This second point is further emphasized by the inspired translation of the Bible, which Joseph Smith engaged in until his death. These perceptions encourage Latter-day Saints to engage with the New Testament in a way that aids them in locating the most correct form of the text, either through historical or inspirational means. To facilitate such a study of the biblical text, Joseph Smith established the School of the Prophets to cultivate within the leadership of the church a uniquely Latter-day Saint approach to the study of scripture, including the New Testament. It is from these leaders that new approaches to the New Testament would develop in the following decades. The introduction of new approaches to the study of the Bible in the 19th century, particularly those aimed to study the Bible in the same way as any other book, required Protestant Christians in America to develop new methods of presenting the biblical narrative to the rising generation. Local sectarian groups produced publications aimed at the young and new converts, as well as formed Sunday schools. As Mary Wern has identified, the Sunday school movement in America started in the early 19th century to instill social behaviors associated with religious virtue, primarily obedience. To aid these denominational Bibles and Sunday schools, scripture catechisms, short sayings organized in a question and answer format intended for memorization, were a primary and popular source for education in the Bible in the 19th century. The tradition of publications and catechisms instructing youth and adults on the Bible carried over to the church in Utah. As Ken Alford has observed, converts to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints often brought with them a catechistic background. Thus, catechisms were a familiar religious education device to many early Latter-day Saint converts. It was a natural extension, therefore, for Latter-day Saints to create and use catechisms to teach the doctrines of the Restoration. Beginning with the 23rd November 1872 issue of the Juvenile Instructor, a serial catechism titled Questions and Answers on the Bible appeared within the periodical. This serial provided catechisms on general biblical facts in the first serial, and then published a catechism on the text of the Old Testament weekly 
until the 27 November 1875 edition of the periodical. At this time, the publication of the series became erratic. This practice continued until the 1st of January 1879, when it appears that the catechisms were removed from the circulation schedule ahead of the publication of various catechisms by the juvenile instructor office in book form. In addition to the serial publication of Questions and Answers to the Bible, Eliza R. Snow published Bible Questions and Answers for Children in 1881. Snow explained the purpose for the volume in her own words as being an aid in impressing the minds of the children with important facts in the Old and New Testament. While the questions posed by Snow were no different than other catechisms, the publication did not speak solely from the Bible, but of the Bible through the lens of the restored gospel. Although Latter-day Saints held meetings of various types that involved the discussion, expansion, and study of the Bible from the beginning of the dispensation, it wasn't until the saints settled in the West that church leaders founded an official arm of the church devoted to the study of doctrine and authoritative texts. The early stages of the Sunday school focused on education and of children in settings that imitated other schools of the day and included a New Testament department with its own commissioners. The content of these Sunday school courses for the Latter-day Saints, which included study of the New Testament, played a central role in the formation of the Sunday School throughout the 19th century. As the official publication of the Sunday School, the bi-weekly juvenile instructor served as the primary curriculum for attendees and teachers to the school. As is evident today, the establishment of the Sunday School and its heritage for studying the New Testament continues to influence members of the church throughout the world. The general acceptance of the validity of the biblical text as historical fact began to change in public perception in the latter third of the 19th century with the rise of higher criticism or the application of scientific methods for the study of religion. This view encouraged the publication of new translations of the Bible as individuals began to modify their traditional conceptualization of the Bible as being infallible. Additional translations of the Bible followed over the next 50 years. Scholars and religious adherents sought to create a translation of the Bible that satisfied the changing needs of the students of the Bible. Furthermore, citizens began to have greater access to public and higher education following the American Civil War, leading to a professionalization of the academic life and a perpetuation of academic ideals, leading faith traditions to establish places of learning patterned after the academy, but advancing the beliefs of the tradition. While an entire discussion surrounding the establishment of religious education, from BYU to seminaries and institutes within the church, could have been presented here, my focus is on the literary elements found on the New Testament in this era. The rise in the critical New Testament scholarship at this time threatened traditional understandings of the nature and character of Jesus Christ and the validity of Christian claims to a historical, accurate, and dependable New Testament. James E. Talmadge served as an example of such an approach. With his advanced degrees in geology and education from Lehigh and John Hopkins universities, Talmadge utilized his position to produce his seminal work, Jesus the Christ, written as a response to the criticisms of this period about the New Testament, particularly growing discuss discussions that diminish the divine character and nature of Jesus Christ. Influenced by other writers who preceded him, Talmadge wrote a response to higher criticism as it pertained to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Talmadge's purpose is made clear in the preface to the volume. It is particularly congruous and appropriate that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the only church that affirms authority based on specific revelation and commission to use the Lord's holy name as a distinctive designation, should set forth her doctrines concerning the Messiah and his mission. While Talmadge provided the messages, the church provided the platform for the, its dissemination. The influence of Talmadge's work within the membership of the church cannot be overstated. Congruent with Talmadge's work on the Savior in combating the rise of secularism as it pertained to the New Testament is the work of J. Reuben Clark. While Talmadge focused on combating secular manipulations of the character and nature of Christ as seen in the restored gospel, Clark's work sought to combat the growing distrust in the biblical text and in the King James Version of the Bible. Clark was highly educated and revered in the field of law and a prolific writer. Clark, who would later serve in the First Presidency of the Church, devoted himself in his leadership capacities 
to ensure that the rise of secularism did not breach church education. Two publications from President Clark pr played a primary role in shaping the way in which Latter-day Saints approached learning about and studying the New Testament. His book, which was a compilation of notes on the King James Version of the Bible titled Why the King James Version, and a lecture given to church educators entitled The Chartered Course. While Clark's work influenced Latter-day Saints in their attitudes and approaches toward their study of the New Testament and New Testament scholarship, it is telling that Clark emphasized his belief that, quote, publications by general authorities required not only prior permission of the church president, but also disclaimers of official endorsement. Therefore, even after President Clark obtained permission of President McKay to publish the book's first words were, for this book I am alone responsible. It is not a church publication. Such an approach to the contributing to Latter-day Saints study of the New Testament from one's own perspective was the driving factor of New Testament study for the next 60 years. For the last 60 years, a divine A divide in Christian interpretation concerning the New Testament between conservative and liberal readings has widened by the explosion of publications that influence students of the Bible to adhere to their respective ideologies. Since 1960, no less than 20 different translations of the Bible have become available. Additionally, various commentaries of the books of the New Testament have been published along the wide range of interpretive ideologies, making interpretation even more inaccessible in the plethora of commentaries translations and opinions that are available through the, law, the World Wide Web. Like Christianity at large, there exists a divide among students of the New Testament and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints concerning interpretation. Unlike other Christian congregations, the Latter-day Saints are, not, are left to decide for themselves. Terrell Givens has observed his, this abundant degree of allowance in his own study of the time. Given states, the absence of a clear pronouncement for the church leadership on matters of scriptural interpretation means that members have a good deal of latitude in how they interpret subjects in the Bible. The lack of an official statement requires individual Latter-day Saints to decide for themselves how they interpret, we believe the Bible to be the word of God so far as it is translated correctly. For decades, the interpretation of this statement was, has been construed to support both the conservative and progressive views of the scripture within the church. While given the gr this great deal of freedom in identifying an appropriate interpretation of the scriptures, Latter-day Saints have been widely influenced by competing and compelling sources. Philip Barlow states, Latter-day Saints are urged to depend primarily on the scriptures rather than on the works about the scriptures. And further states, from among the many expressions of the faith articulated throughout its history, one particular expression will have an unofficial, perhaps even an inadvertent, but nevertheless, the implied support of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Givens maintains that the unofficial support has been predominantly given to the conservative interpretations championed by individuals like Joseph Fielding Smith and Bruce R. McConkie. However, Barlow's recognition that the official position of the church is one of individual freedom is instructive when studying the work on the New Testament in the current age. While the work of McConkie, Smith, and Clark are more recognized because of their leadership positions in the church, other works by Latter-day Saints who reach more liberal observations are equally accessible. Though it must be recognized that their works each contain the caveat that the opinions and views are those of the individual alone and not of the church. The church now finds itself at the start of a new era in New Testament study as the church pivots to the primary responsibility of study from the church to the family. This pivot also emphasizes the necessity of learning by the spirit as the ideas for family scripture study and family home evening almost always emphasize the spirit can help you know what principles to emphasize and discuss in order to meet the needs of your family. That comes from each of the Come Follow Me manuals. New Testament resources, which for years have focused on teachers, both seminary and institute and gospel doctrine alike, will now need to likewise adapt to being written primarily to families and aid them in their home study of the New Testament. Publications like Lincoln Blumel's New Testament History, Culture, and Society, as well as Thomas Wayman's translation of the New Testament for Latter-day Saints, prove to be examples of how such publications can aid families in their study of the text. In conclusion. 
As has been outlined above, the Latter-day Saint study of the New Testament has never been a monolithic pursuit. As time has progressed, different approaches have been influenced by the presuppositions of the world and by reactions to it. It is within this heritage that the new BYU New Testament commentary series is contributing to the overall history of the New Testament study of the church. Drawing upon the different perspectives from different scholars, the BYU New Testament commentary series will provide a plethora of voices about the New Testament text. By providing translations and commentary, the BYU New Testament commentary fulfills the, this commission given by Brigham Young in 1971. The BYU New Testament commentary aims to fulfill this charge from the second president of the church and build upon the great legacy of seeking to be instructed in the way of the Lord by study and also by 